what a tremendous time we had in God's presence this morning. What a really tremendous time we had in God's presence. And apologies to all of you who are listening on a podcast or something in the future. And here I am saying, what a great time we had in God's presence. But quite frankly, what a great time we had in God's presence. And this morning is another example of why it's really good to be on time for church. Because uh, I wouldn't want you to have missed even a second of what we experienced in God's presence. Um, this is a really good reason for us to be here in, in the flesh, personally, because we get to experience God's presence together. We get to worship Him together, amen. and we get to hear His voice together. Yes, amen. Um, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is. amen. He really is glorious. He is glorious. He's wonderful. <clears throat> He's worthy of it all. Amen. From Him are all things, and to whom are all things, and He deserves the glory. Amen. He's wonderful, isn't he? Yes, he is. <laughs> and I really pray that none of us ever lose our sense of wonder about Jesus. Yes. He is wonderful. Yes. He's, there's no disappointment in him. Yes, that's right. No decay, no disease, no lying, no deceit. Yes. He's absolutely wonderful. And um, the amazing thing is, if you're a Christian, you're in him. Let me remind you of some of the things that we've talked about the last few months. Let me remind you of what we said last week. The book of Ephesians tells us that in Christ, we are God's holy people. Yes, amen. We were singing to him, holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty? There's no one like him. He's totally unique. And yet he has made us his holy people. In Christ, we're his faithful people. In Christ, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Yes. Yes. It's good for you to agree with those things, by the way, because it actually seals something Amen. for you. Amen. Your agreement with God's word actually releases something for you in your present day experience. Which is why Paul says, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. One of the most misquoted scriptures in the whole of the New Testament. The promises of God are not yes and amen in Christ. They're yes in Christ, and they're amen in us. The amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So it's actually our, our agreement, our verbal agreement with God's promises that actually can activate them in our lives. Which is why it's very, very difficult to receive healing if you're constantly confessing how sick you are. But that's a message for another time. In Christ, we are chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In Christ, we are forgiven of our sins. He prayed that this morning. God has forgiven us all our sins, past, present, and future. What a gift forgiveness is. You know, I recently tried to ask God for forgiveness for something I'd already asked him forgiveness of. What an empty. And he was like, I've already forgiven you. I felt so good about it. <laughs> I thought, I've got to learn that lesson again. Yeah. He really has forgiven. Yes. Amen. In Christ, we have an inheritance. Yes, we do. Yeah. Unspoiled, can't ever be stolen. Rust can't take it away. Moths can't eat it up. In Christ, we have an inheritance. Yes. In Christ, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's God's way of saying, you're mine. In Christ, we're seated with him in the heavenly places, which we'll come back to again in a moment. In Christ, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. In Christ, and this happened to us this morning, we are being built together to be a dwelling place for God. What were we doing this morning? We came from different parts of Cardiff, different parts of South Wales. We came together. We, we'd had different experiences in the week. And by the end of our 30, 40 minutes of offering praise and sacrifice to God, we were sing, singing and saying the same thing to him. One voice was coming up to the Father. Hundreds of voices had become one voice. And we were offering spiritual sacrifices to God. Another good reason to be here on a Sunday morning. Amen.
I've said this to you last week, but we have come to see that all of God's plans and purposes focus on and find their fulfillment in Christ Jesus. So that we can say with Paul that God is uniting all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. If you'd asked the Lord at any point this week, hey Lord, what are you doing this week? He'd have said, oh, I'm just um, you know, uniting all things in heaven and on earth into Christ. Because that's what he's always doing. We've come to realize that the church has a unique and significant role to play in God's purpose here and now. I read this to you last week. I read this this morning, and I'm going to read it to you again because I love it. The church is God's vehicle by which the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is what was happening this morning. We weren't just singing songs and lifting hands. Actually, those things point to greater realities. Lifted hands are signs of surrender, also signs of victory. And, and, and as we're offering God singing, it's a, a vehicle by which we can, we can actually offer him something that goes into the spiritual realm and is a witness to the heavenly rulers and authorities. God's able to go, look at all these people that I purchased from here, there, and everywhere, and now they're mine, and together they're offering me something. That's why it's good to be here on a Sunday morning, Amen. Why is the church God's vehicle to display the manifold wisdom? Because it was in accordance with his eternal purpose that he's realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. We concluded our gathering last week by saying this together. Ephesians 3 verses 20 to 20, uh, 3, 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And that's again what's happening among us this morning. What were we saying to him? You deserve the glory. <laughs> he does. None of us, when we get to see the Lord face to face, none of us are going to be disappointed that he gets all the credit and we don't. We'll be saying to him, you deserve all the glory. Thank you for using me in part to bring you glory. You deserve all the glory. Now today we're going to continue our journey through the book of Ephesians. So could you open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to discover more about who we are in Christ, what we have in him, and perhaps most significantly, what we can do in him. And as I've said to you before... This in Christ formula almost entirely disappears in the second half of Ephesians. It doesn't completely disappear. We find in the Lord and in Jesus mentioned, but nowhere near as much as the first three chapters. But the whole section is a sustained practical outworking of the first three chapters. It's really important that when we're reading things in weeks and months to come, we're going to be looking at how we speak and how we think and how we love one another and how marriages function and how families function and how we behave in the workplace. All of it is, is, is from that place of the fact that we are in Christ. We're his people. Bring him glory. We're the ones he said. I'm going to give you more victory this year than you've ever had before. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse 16. And this is the English standard version of the Bible. And Paul begins this way. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Yeah, what did I say? God, you, sorry. Thanks, Dad. Good job, Dad. Well done. Ephesians 4, verse 1. It's the kind of thing I used to do to him, but <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives 
and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I don't often say this when I finish reading a, pas reading a passage, but this is the Word of God. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. Your word is unique. Yes. We love it. We, do. we read it, we hear it, we confess it, we believe it, we do it. Yes. And we're humbly asking you today for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to open your word to us again. That this vital passage of scripture may be awake and alive to us today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is possibly one of the most important passages in the whole of the Bible. Although I would say that because I'm preaching from it, wouldn't I? <clears throat> but like any good story, I'd like us to begin in the middle. Like us to begin in the middle. In the middle of this passage I've read to you, not once, not twice, but three times, Paul reminds us that Jesus Christ has ascended on high. Yeah. Jesus Christ has ascended on high. Yeah. We need to keep that in mind this morning. And we need to keep that in mind at all times. The process that began with the incarnation was followed by a perfect life. It was followed then by an innocent death on the cross. It was followed by a resurrection from the dead. And that was followed by an ascension to the right hand of the Father in glory and majesty on high. The Lord Jesus came. We celebrate that at Christmas. Is it okay to mention Christmas in January? Sorry. We celebrate the incarnation. The word became flesh. He dwelt among us. We have in the Gospels little insights into his earthly life and service. And we find without a doubt he lived a perfect and blameless life. Never made a mistake. Never committed a sin. Never said something he later wished he could take back. Never did something he later regretted. In every, every situation, he set the perfect example that humanity could follow at any time throughout history. Despite the fact, or maybe because he lived a perfect life, he was killed as an innocent man. He was crucified. And he actually, to quote my children, actually died. And God raised him from the dead. He actually raised him from the dead. So that the Lord Jesus had a resurrection body. And one day, we're all going to have a resurrection body as well. We don't live in hope for some spiritual future floating around in the air. We have a hope that one day Jesus will return to this earth and he's going to make the whole heavens and the whole earth new and we will receive from him an immortal, indestructible body. No more pain, no more sickness, no more disease, no more evil, no more jealousy, no more lying, no more cheating, no more poverty, no more hypocrisy. All evil, which is merely a temporary aberration in this good universe, will be destroyed once and for all and the kingdom of God will reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever.
That's right. And it's important we remember that because I think living in North Cardiff is pretty close to the new creation, if I'm honest. <laughs> it's quite a nice quality of life. It's not bad at all. No war zones. Very little persecution. Sure, you might have to stand in line at the grocery store for a little while and you can't get your appointment with the doctor necessarily the day you want it to. But it's not a bad quality of life, is it? But this life is not all there is. It's like there's much more. So Deborah was right to encourage us this morning. Let's live constantly with this cry within our heart. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus, having been raised from the dead, was subsequently taken up into heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's living an ascension life. He's no longer standing around. He's seated at the Father's right hand. In fact, Paul had already said to us in Ephesians chapter 1, God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. You ever, when I, um, you ever watch those programs? Or you, whatever happened to that footballer? Whatever happened to that uh, movie star? Whatever happened to that, that, that politician? Where are they now? And they kind of go and find out that you know, they're living out you know, in a stick somewhere or they've you know, retired to the Maldives or whatever. Occasionally people can think like that about Jesus. Where is he now? I wonder what Jesus is doing. The Lord Jesus is sat right now at the right hand of the Father. Far above all rule, authority, power and dominion. Whatever name could be named in this age or the age to come, he's sitting there reigning above it. And he's patiently waiting for all his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet. That's pretty good news, isn't it? I haven't finished. Some of you were disappointed there. Because yes, the Lord Jesus has ascended. But where are we? I'll give you a clue. We're there with him. Ephesians chapter 2. I've read this to you before. Someone's read it to you before. Verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and see you later. No. Ephesians 2 verse 6 says that God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Christian life is not only resurrection life, it's ascension life. It's a life, we've got some people just sitting up, they can't, we can't see them, they can see us. They're behind that, that, that little screen there, they're monitoring the cameras and stuff like that. Let's give them a wave, we're watching you, okay, we can see you. Okay. They've got a very different vantage point on this gathering than you guys have. You're sitting with your feet on the ground, they're sitting up there. Okay. Things look very different from up there. Okay. The view is very different. Do you know the view from where you're seated with Christ is very, very different? There may well be situations and circumstances that you can see down here that aren't very nice. Wars and rumors of wars. Poverty and disease and jealousy and enmity. But you're, you're far removed from it. Not in the sense of you're removed from it that you don't care. But that you, you, begin, you begin to see God. God can sort all of this out. God's got all, he's going to work all of this together. You, you, you will cry over the news stories. You'll... You'll be moved in your heart with compassion for your neighbor who loses their job. For the child that comes to your school and can't feed themselves in the morning. It's not that you're seated up here and you don't care. It's that you realize, I'm seated here with God, with Christ in heavenly places. I, can see, I, I, I see things from a heavenly point of view. And now I understand the part I've got to play in it. That's why God spoke to us this morning. He prophesied to us again. We're not to worry. Kerry Jones said to us many years ago, worry is the prerogative of an atheist. Yeah. Worry is the prerogative of an atheist. Kerry taught that, taught that to us many years ago. Why we are living yeah. in him who was raised from the dead, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, and is ruling and reigning. And because you seat with him, you can call on him and say, Lord, now this situation in my family, this situation in my neighborhood, this situation in my workplace, this situation in our nation is not right. Lord, would you intervene? 
And it's not a long distance call to heaven. Because you're right there with him. Christ ascended three times, Paul tells us this. And he says, first of all, Christ ascended. You won't be surprised because of what we talked about this morning. He ascended in victory. It says he ascended bringing captives with him. He had won a great victory. And he was going back into the heavenlies to show off the spoils of victory. He ascended in victory. He didn't ascend in escape. He wasn't thinking, oh, I escaped the devil once, but I couldn't do it again. Beam me up, Father. No, he ascended in victory. Secondly, he ascended because he'd first descended to the earth. In other words, God had raised him up because he'd first humbled himself. Thirdly, he's been ascended because from this place now, he's going to fill all things. And I would encourage us to begin all our thoughts and all our actions there. And let's begin all our praise and all our prayers there. So very briefly then, because that was the world's longest introduction, I want to give you three things really briefly this morning that this passage tells us that each believer can enter into because we're in Christ, according to this passage. So very briefly this morning, I'm going to talk to you about three very exciting aspects of the Christian life. Okay? Maintenance, ministry, and maturity. Okay? In Christ, we are all called to maintain something. Now, let's think about maintenance for a moment. It is not the most exciting of concepts. Some of you are yawning already. It's okay, you've got small children, you're allowed to yawn. It's very easy to dismiss maintenance. I've heard churches being dismissed before. Oh, they're just in maintenance mode. They're just going through the motions. Maintenance is vitally important. The the word maintenance comes from an old word meaning to hold in the hand. And uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, which isn't a book in the Bible, which is a useful book nonetheless, says that maintenance means to keep something in good condition by checking or repairing it regularly. Maintenance is keeping something in good condition by checking or repairing it regularly. I did some maintenance yesterday on my son's bicycle. He said, I can't ride my bike anymore. So I got the bike, got this new fancy bike stand I can put on. And there were two things wrong with it, two really simple things wrong. We needed to pump up the tires, and we needed to clean the brakes. And um, I did them both, yeah. But he wasn't able to ride his bicycle because it just needed a little bit of maintenance. It needed something that was just going to keep it in good condition. Now, in Christ, in the church, all of us are called to maintain or to keep something. What are we called to maintain? Ephesians 4 verse 3 encourages us to keep or maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And that really is the culmination of all the character qualities that Paul's already mentioned. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, love. We are to keep, we're to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Now listen carefully. There is a unity amongst Christians that is to be kept, not created. Oh, the pressure that Christians put themselves on to be united when they already are. Oh, the the invitations to unity meetings. This is a unity meeting. The church is fundamentally united. United in spirit. Now, there's another unity we'll come on to in a moment. But the church is fundamentally united. United in spirit. Why? There's one body. There's one spirit. There's one hope. There's one call. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. So we are called to keep the unity or maintain the unity of the spirit. Okay? What does that basically look like? It looks like the peaceful relations between people expressed in humility, gentleness, patience, and tolerance. And how do we do that? How do we maintain that? Well, Paul tells us how to do it through a beautiful Greek word, one of my favorite Greek words. Are you ready? Spoudazontes. Spoudazontes. No one is calling their kids Spoudazontes, are they? Spoudazontes means to make haste. 
It's where we get our word zeal and where we get our word diligence from. Paul says in the translation I read to you, uh, he said, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. In other translations you may have in your hand right now, he'll say things like, make every effort, or be diligent, or be eager. Okay? We are to be zealous for maintenance. I know it's not the most exciting topic in the world. But we're to be zealous for maintenance. Zealous to keep our relationships with one another and our serving together in good working order. Spudazontes, I just like saying the word, sorry. Spudazontes is contrasted in the New Testament with two other Greek words, uh, noturos and ochneros. And um, both of those fundamentally mean to be lazy or to be sluggish or to be remiss. So Paul will say to the Romans, don't be slothful in your zeal. The writers of Hebrews would say, we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. And this, I think, is important for us in terms of what T prophesied to us today. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. You know, T's word to us this morning about entering into victory this year is actually going to require some diligence on our behalf. The offer from God Most High to you today is that you could enjoy more victory this year than ever before. But that isn't a fait accompli. It's not, well, I'll put my feet up and I'll see you in December, Lord. No, that, that word has to be taken hold of. It has to be believed. You have to apply faith to it and patience to it. And that requires spudazontes. In Christ, we're all called to be zealous to keep the peace, to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Let's keep the oil in our relationships. Let's close the gaps if there's been misunderstandings. Let's believe the best instead of believing the worst. In Philippians 4, Paul gives us a great example of people believing the best. He's not had um, a message or any financial support from the Philippians in ages. And he says to them, "Uh, it's great to get your letter, great to get your support. Now, I knew you wanted to help me, but you didn't have the opportunity. Isn't that a great attitude? He could have gone, pesky Philippians, you've not sent me anything in ages. You've forgotten me and you don't love me anymore. No, he believed the best about them. He said, no, I know you'd love to help me, but you haven't got the opportunity. What a great attitude. Sorry, I got all funny with my hands in. Sorry about that. All of us are called to maintenance, to keeping the peace. Okay, we'll move on. All of us, all of us, say all. All all of us are called to ministry. Yes, amen. I believe that. All of us are called to ministry. And the word ministry simply means service. It's the Greek word diakonos, where we get our word deacon from. So to be a minister is to be a servant. So when we talk about the prime minister of our country, that phrase literally means the first servant. That might change some of the ambitions of people who want to be prime minister, eh? In political circles, the word minister is often equated with status or power. Now, tragically, in church circles, ministry can be seen the same way. In Ephesians 4... Paul tells us that Christ, the ascended Christ, the Christ who's ruling and reigning, sitting at the right hand of the Father, has given gifts to the church, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And he says that those gifts have been given by Christ to equip or to prepare the saints for ministry. Now, we have been telling you for the last, we've been telling you for years, but we've been specifically telling you for the last few months If you're in Christ, you're a saint. So when Paul is saying that the saints are being equipped for ministry, he's talking about all of us. The ministry in Ephesians 4 is performed by the saints, which includes the gifts, not merely the gifts themselves. If you want to describe an Ephesians 4 ministry, you're talking about the body. 
There are other passages where it's clear that apostles and prophets and so on are ministers themselves. In fact, in Ephesians 3, Paul says, I've become a minister of the gospel. But we mustn't think, and I, I'm, I'm concerned that this is creeping in, by the way. That's why I'm mentioning it today. I'm concerned it's creeping in. That we think that the work is to be done by the ministries. Well, you're right. The work is to be done by the ministries, and that's all of us. Everyone has got a part to play. Everyone has got service to render the Lord. Everyone belongs. If you would like to be part of a Sunday morning experience where you can come and attend and leave again, this might not be the permanent home God has for you. Because what we believe, and Ephesians 4 shows us this, what, what, what God is looking for in his church is a, a, a body where every member, every part of the body is doing its work. Everyone has got a part to play. Every Christian is called to ministry, to service. There's work for everyone to do. What's more, the work involves building up the body. It's not merely you and I doing our own thing in Christ Jesus. If it's a genuine ministry God has given you, in some way, shape, or form, it'll serve to build up the church. Not exclusively. There's, oh gosh, there's a kingdom to extend. There's a world to reach. But part of what you're doing will involve building up the body. If we never see you because you're off doing ministry, I'm not convinced you're doing ministry. He says with a smile. Now, key to applying this effectively is learning to appreciate that different service is rendered to the same Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 5, Paul says there are different kinds of service or different kinds of ministry, but the same Lord. So the way I serve the Lord might be different from how you're currently serving the Lord. Okay, We didn't only have, let's just take this morning example, we didn't have 200 stewards, did we? Although it would have been interesting. We've got people serving us and serving the Lord in different ways this morning. We've got people out teaching our children right now. We've got some some guys at the back there who are keeping the lights on and making sure the microphone's working. We had some fantastic people leading us in song this morning, didn't we? Um, After the meeting, we're going to have some amazing tea and coffee that's been prepared by the wonderful Karen Coe over in the corner. I always try to get here as early as I can on Sunday morning to prepare, and Karen always beats me to it. She's here before me. We don't see what she's doing, but she's getting the tea and the coffee ready. And so thank you, Karen. We honor you for what you're doing. And we recognize, therefore, that all different kinds of service are being rendered to the same Lord. All of it matters. Some of it's seen, some of it's unseen, but all of it matters. Years ago, a guy came to see me. I used to lead the student work here in the church, and the guy came to see me and said, your problem, James, your problem is that you're so obsessed with students. I said, I hope so. I lead the student ministry. I said, what are you passionate about? He goes, I'm passionate about the homeless. I was like, great, go for it. And he was like, what? And he, he couldn't understand that I could appreciate what he was passionate about. Because but the poor gentleman, he couldn't recognize that what we were both doing was serving the same Lord. Amen. We're all serving the same Lord. Some of you this week have visited the sick. Thank you for doing that. Some of you have baked a cake or delivered someone a meal. Some of you have written a letter or sent a WhatsApp message. Other of you have you've, you've, you've opened your home for a small group. Some of you have been a listening ear this week. Some of you have invited a friend to Alpha. Some of you have um, opened this building up early so we could meet here. You've done scores and scores of things, most of which we don't know about, but the Lord does. And it's all service to Him. Everyone is a servant. No one is beyond serving. No one is beneath serving. Uh, My dad heckled me earlier on, so I'm going to use him as an illustration now. Um, Many of you will know dad. um, He's he's been here for a long time. Uh, He's led the church on a couple of occasions. He's been an elder here. He's preachers and teachers. Where are you off preaching next week, dad? Where are you next week? So Thank you, T. He's He's preaching in Southport next Sunday. But last Sunday, dad was here on the door with his here-to-help lanyard, part of the welcome team. He doesn't think, I'm done, no more serving for me. 
He doesn't think, well, I'll only, I'll only preach, I'll only travel. No, he says, here's a place I can serve now, I'm going to help. That's a servant. Every one of us has got service to render. Every one of us has got ministry to perform. And we have talked to you about this so many times. We've talked to you about this so many times. And we'll continue to talk to you about it. Because to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, is to be a servant. Finally, really quickly, all of us, is, all of us are called to maturity. The Greek word is teleos, which means perfection or complete. Now, it's really, the danger with me saying to you, we're all called to ministry, we're all called to service, we're all called to do stuff for God, is that we could create a church that's just full of worker bees. Yeah. Or dare I say, a church full of slaves. Where you're just doing stuff, doing stuff, doing stuff, doing stuff, doing stuff, doing stuff, doing stuff. No, God's, God has got far more for us than, than simply going through the motions of, of activity. The church is not only a colony of worker bees. The, the gifts not only equip us for ministry, they help us grow in our knowledge of God's Son. We're not only called to serve God, we're also called to grow in our knowledge of Him. Just think of the words of the Lord Jesus Himself in John 15. I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. There's not only an invitation to serve him, there's also an invitation to know him. And it's not one without the other. All of us are invited, all of us are called to grow up in our knowledge and our attitude and our characteristics like the Son of God. These two things, serving God and knowing God are designed to help us grow. And growth in the New Testament is not about numerical increase. The word for that in the New Testament is multiplication. But when the New Testament writers talk about um, increasing in our Christ-like character, uh, increasing, uh, exhibiting more and more faith and love, they use the word grow. All of us are called to grow up. All of us are called to maturity. Here are some examples of what it looks like to grow up in Christ from Ephesians 4. The first one is this. You're not taken in by every new teaching. And you're not led astray by every new idea. Often people who are led astray by false teaching think that they're the mature ones. When actually they're children. If you're constantly distracted from what we're teaching you by stuff that you can find elsewhere, I'm not convinced that you're growing up. And if you are a Christian who is constantly interested in new fads and philosophies and ideas, then I would suggest to you that you're being taken captive by human cunning. If you're into the latest fad, always into the latest diet, always the latest into the next life hack, Okay? If you're always interested in the next self-help book or um, positive mentality podcast, then I would suggest to you that you're in danger of being taken captive by human cunning. Because a hallmark of someone who's growing up in Christ is they're not constantly being dragged back and forth by everything that comes their way. There's a certain solidity and steadfastness to them because they're growing up in Christ. Here's a more positive evidence that you're growing up in Christ. We speak the truth in love. We neither speak the truth without.